coincidences are so funny sometimes. For example, uh, just a few days after I heard the song, the weather itself reminded me that, yes, indeed, I do love a rainy night. Greetings, one and all, and welcome once again to Tom's Hit Parade. Uh, it is time for my monthly playlist video again. This is the video where I just talk about the stuff that I've listened to over the past month. Can't get a much simpler video than that from me, can ya? Uh, so yes, and uh, also in addition to talking about what I've listened to, I talk about whatever else music-related might be on my mind, music-related or channel-related. And uh, there's really only one thing, and that is recognizing, some, this is something that I sometimes do when it happens, uh, recognizing the passing of some music luminaries from the past 30 days. The only one of note that, you know, in my own personal music universe, so to speak, uh, is Jim Steinman. He was the longtime songwriter and collaborator with Meatloaf. Uh, I have his uh, Bad Out of Hell 2 CD here, probably my favorite Meatloaf album. Great stuff. He, of course, did the entire Bat Out of Hell trilogy, as well as a, a couple of other Meatloaf albums, along with a bunch of other ones. For instance, Bonnie Tyler, her album, Faster Than the Speed of Night, which includes her big, big hit, Total Eclipse of the Heart. Obviously, it's one of the big, biggest hits of all time, honestly, out of the 80s. And uh, this is a very, very good album, by the way, and he also did the album before this one uh, of Bonnie Tyler's. Can you expect anything but great songwriting out of Jim Steinman, honestly? But yeah, one of the interesting things in the liner notes of this album, just uh, on, while I'm on the topic, while I've got the album up here in front of me, a couple of the people that uh, backed Bonnie Tyler in his, uh, the band on this album, Rick Derringer was a guitarist. He was the producer for uh, Weird Al Yankovic's first several albums. That's the thing that I know him most for. <laughs> That's what you're getting from me, okay? Uh, I'm sure he's, he's a great musician in his own right, aside from that credit of uh, just producing Weird Al. But... Uh, Yes, it's, it's kind of one thing that attaches me to this album, is his connection with Weird Al. But also Max Weinberg, who was the band leader uh, for Conan O'Brien for several years, and Larry Fast, a synthesizer guru of, of sorts, a big synthesizer virtuoso, I guess you'd say, in the world of music. So, yeah, a bunch of interesting musicians who backed Bonnie Tyler on this album. Uh, just as a little trivia note, I guess, uh, while, while I was on the subject. But anyway, that's all that I have for the intro or the, the liner notes, I guess you'd say, for the uh, beginning part of this video. So let's go ahead and get into the playlist proper. And uh, as you know, I like to talk about five albums, the, the five most memorable, I guess, that I've listened to from each format of music uh, that I listened to over the past month. And I like to shuffle around the order of the formats I talk about. So let's talk about vinyl today, uh, first off. So the first one is the, the, the odd man out out of the uh, albums that I have. This is a current album or a recent release. It was released back in 2019, I think it was. Uh, it is Black Pumas, their self-titled album. This might have been a 2020, I can't remember. But yeah, I was recommended this by, I think it was Garrett over at Yes, Young Ent Entertainment Specialist. Great channel, by the way, if you haven't uh, watched it. Uh, it's in my uh, list of recommendations down in the description. Uh, but yeah, great stuff. And I, I had heard their song Colors on, like, what's on TV commercials or, or somewhere on TV a couple of times over the past several months and finally decided to pick up the album and... Uh, it was it was worth the wait, honestly. It was fantastic stuff. Great uh, soul-tinged rock. Couldn't put down a, a any least favorite songs on the album. I mean, they're all just great. So yeah, if you have not listened to the Black Pumas self-titled album, check it out. It is great. And uh, yes, the rest of them are kind of be kind of like throwback albums. Uh, first of all, let's let's do the odd one out of this one, which is jazz. The rest of them are kind of rock and pop. But uh, as far as jazz goes. Uh, Herb Alpert's 1980 album, Rise. Uh, this one had uh, the title track, which was probably his most notable hit uh, since the stuff that he did with the Tijuana Brass back in the uh, late 60s, Tijuana Taxi and uh, Whipped Cream and Other Delights. A lot of the songs off that album got really famous. But yes, Rise was one of his uh, uh, more more recent hits, I guess, I mean, if you can call the early 80s more recent. But anyway, yes, very fun album. I have never been disappointed in any Herb Alpert album. Uh, so yeah, just great stuff here. This was at Tausa Records uh, in the New Arrivals used stuff. And I had been kind of looking for it in the back of my, on my mental wish list for a while. So yeah, I was glad to pick it up and was not disappointed. And then we have, this was an album actually that was on my Discogs wish list for a while. And it happened to show up at Tausa Records. I think it was the same time as, as uh, Herb Alpert's Rise. This is Knee Deep in the Hoopla by Starship. 
This was probably their most successful album uh, during their days as Starship. Obviously, the, uh, some of the members formed Jefferson Starship back in the uh, uh, in the late seventies, early eighties, and before that, Jefferson Airplane. They were all kind of connected, had uh, at least a few of the same members throughout the uh, years. But yes, We Built This City was uh, the, the big hit on this on this album. And what, there was another one? Oh, Sarah was another great hit off this album, yeah. The uh, Jefferson Airplane and Jefferson Starship purists kind of look down on this album because it is more commercial, it is more pop than their earlier stuff, uh, which, you know, it kind of just stands to reason, I guess you'd say. But still, I have a soft spot for this album. Being an 80s kid, I love this album, so, yeah. Two more 80s. Yeah, this one was from the late, late 80s. This is Taylor Dane with her debut album, Tell It To My Heart. Uh, she is probably the uh, 80s pop art slash R&B diva that I most enjoy. And uh, yeah, just a bunch of good good hits off this one. Uh, the title track, of course, Tilt to My Heart. Uh, Don't Rush Me was another great hit off this album. A fantastic song. And uh, Where Does That Boy Hang Out? That was, uh, I, I can't remember if that was an actual single or, or if it was a B-side. Uh, a, a friend of mine turned that one, turned me on to that one. And that just kind of, that's one of those that gets stuck in your head. Kind of like a lot of the songs on this album. But yes, a lot of fun, this album. And I just ordered her sophomore album, and I'm waiting for it to arrive in the mail. So, yeah. Fun, fun stuff. She's kind of, she's almost right up there with uh, Paula Abdul. I really like uh, some Paula Abdul stuff. Mainly just her first album, though. But yeah, uh, Taylor Dane's second album is almost as good as her first album, honestly. So, yeah. Don't be afraid to pick either of those up. And then finally, one of my favorite uh, albums and artists from the 80s, Culture Club. Uh, this is their sophomore album, Color by Numbers, and this has my favorite Culture Club song and one of my favorite songs of the entire decade of the 80s, Church of the Poison Mind. That is just such a great song, and it has, is it Loliata Holloway who is uh, um, back at vocalist? I can't remember. I might just be pulling a name out of my head. But um, yeah, she has a great, uh, I, I guess it's called a counterpoint in the chorus, you know, overlapping her and Boy George. There's, it's just, it's just a, gr a great, uh, great catchy chorus, and the song is just fantastic, and the lyrics kind of have a personal meaning to me. But yes, this is also the album that bore the hit Karma Chameleon, one of their biggest hits of, of uh, their career. And uh, yeah, I can't... Oh, Miss Me Blind is another big hit of theirs, one of their biggest, most popular hits. So yeah, a fantastic album, and it goes right up there with... This is actually probably a little bit better, though, actually, than their debut album, Kissing to be Clever. But they are both, uh, if you like 80s pop slash new wave stuff, uh, both of those albums are just not to be missed. Fantastic stuff. Okay, now on to the CDs that I listened to over the past month, the highlights of the CDs. Uh, now, I might have mentioned this in a previous playlist video or some other video recently, but it was a few months back. There is a independent, or actually used to be independent, but now I think it's owned by Universal, a label that specializes in soundtrack issues of uh, mostly CD, but they've moved in, they've branched out into vinyl over the last couple of years. They're called Verez Sarabande, and I've enjoyed their re releases for since the mid-80s, late 80s, uh, for, so for a long, long time. And they have, either have or had, I'm not sure if it still exists, an imprint called Verez Vintage, which specializes in rock and pop and country uh, releases, archival releases that they reissue. Back in, I think it was December, maybe might have been earlier even, they were having a big sale online on their website where uh, a lot of, uh, or might have been all, of the Verez Vintage CDs were on sale for like two or three dollars or, or, or a little bit more. Some of them were a little more. And I picked up five or six or seven of them and have been so slowly listening to them over the ensuing months. And uh, these first two in my list are from that uh, score that I bought online. This first one is Songs Our Daddy Taught Us by the Everly Brothers. Now, if you guys are familiar with the album called Foreverly, that was a collaboration between Billy Joe Armstrong of Green Day and Nora Jones, uh, that was actually the the uh, track listing of this album redone by Nora Jones and Billy Joe Armstrong. So that that was kind of the this is the inspiration for that album of theirs, Foreverly. And I've kind of been wanting to pick up that album. I never have, uh, but now that I have the album that inspired it. I'm very, very seriously considering picking that album up finally and comparing them. I'm not sure if there were any big singles that came off of this album. This is mostly, oh, what is it, country and I think some gospel and traditional and songs that their daddy taught them, hence the title. So, and this has 
six bonus tracks on it. So, and that was one thing that was kind of a hallmark of the Verez vintage releases. A lot of them had bonus tracks that the original releases of the albums didn't have. And uh, so, yeah, that was a lot of fun to listen to. Uh, it's uh, one that I kind of, you know, being a serious music fan, as, as much as I try to be, uh, is one that I kind of felt I needed to listen to at some point. Uh, and then this next one was also part of the Verez sale, that as, as I mentioned. Les Paul and his trio with the album Crazy Rhythm. Les Paul, if you don't know, is was a pioneer of the electric guitar. Yeah, I have one of his albums with Mary Ford, a greatest hits compilation on CD. And uh, but other than that, this is the only one that I've picked up. So and this was a lot of fun. Uh, you took advantage of me, one of the uh, Rogers and Hart classic songs, and uh, some a bunch of old uh, you know Great American Songbook standards. Uh, it's only a paper moon. Nice work if you can get it. I mean, a lot of great fun songs that that we kind of all know that Les Paul and his trio do in their own inimitable style. It had to be you, another classic song. So yeah. This is, if you can uh, get your hands on it, if you like uh, that classic stuff, uh, I, I would highly recommend this album. It's just fantastic. And of course, Les Paul being a guitar guru, fantastic, fantastic. And what, what can I say? My vocabulary is not all that expansive sometimes. These next two were part of the uh, my recent acquisitions. When I mentioned I picked them up, I hadn't listened to them yet. Or maybe I had listened to this first one. Um, but by the time I did the video, but hey, I like it so much that I had to mention it again. This is uh, a rock group called Pound. This was done in 1999, this, this album, uh, called Same Old Life. And, and I believe it was their only album, or at least it was their only major label album. And I have no idea why, because this was just amazing. This is a great, great album. Uh, as I mentioned in my video, when I saw this on the shelf at a record store up in Salem, uh, I could remember the choruses of several of the songs just by reading the track list so that was a sign that I, I had to pick this album up again and I had gotten rid of it years ago in a space crunch uh, CD pruning and I am so sorry that I got rid of it because it's just some a great great uh, album uh, My World and Upside Down and Crazy and the song Accident I mean the entire first half of the album is just amazing awesome I mean the songs will get stuck in your head great great alternative rock stuff if you can track the CD down, if you see it on the shelves, pick it up. Do not hesitate. It's just excellent. And then this uh, next one was uh, in my uh, mail orders, and it was inspired by a recent Bargain Bag CD. Uh, some some of my viewers have been wanting to uh, hear my uh, thoughts on this band when I finally got around to listening to them, which I hadn't done by the time I did my re recent acquisitions. Poi Dog Pondering. Uh, this is their sophomore album, Wishing Like a Mountain and Thinking Like the Sea. I love that album title. I listened to all, th all four of them that I picked up, uh, but I wanted to uh, point this one out because this is the one that kind of got me curious about the band in the first place. Now, there was a TV show back in the early 90s. It was called Parker Lewis Can't Lose, and it was basically a uh, a ripoff, I guess you'd say, if to, to put it indelicately, of the Ferris Bueller thing. And whereas the Ferris Bueller series didn't even last a full season, uh, Parker Lewis went on to run three seasons. So yes, it was a, a great show. One thing about Ferris Bueller is they did a great job at picking out songs for the series. I mean, they had a song by Frank Zappa and a bunch of other stuff. They should have put out a soundtrack album for that series because it was just amazing. And the DVDs actually uh, had the songs that were originally in the show because of licensing issues. You know, a lot of when they put out DVDs nowadays, a lot of the songs get uh, have to be taken out and replaced with generic songs. But they, they spared no expense putting out the Season 1 Parker Lewis DVDs because they kept all the original songs in there, a Frank Zappa song and several others. But one of the songs that was in the pilot episode, it was off of this album. It was called Uli Lalu. And for years and years, I just assumed that that was, because this, the chorus was just kind of nonsensical, I just assumed that it was a throwaway song that the writers of the episode just whipped up and put together in an afternoon. But in watching the episode one day, I decided to Shazam it and realized that it was, in fact, a real song by a real artist, Poi Dog Pondering. And so that's what uh, got me to stream a few of their other songs, listen to them, and I really kind of liked the sound. Uh, it was this, These guys are kind of uh, folk rock with a little bit of ethnic elements in it. Uh, the band originates in Hawaii, but uh, you know, several of the members, I think, uh, lived in Hawaii or grew up in Hawaii. But the music is not necessarily Hawaiian or uh, Pacific Islander music. But it does have, as I said, a few little ethnic elements in it. 
but yeah, otherwise it's just, you know, it's nice folk rock from the early 90s. Great stuff. I would recommend any of their first well, five albums because I have all, all five of their first albums. So yes, to make a really long story short, good band. And then the last title in the CD portion of my playlist today uh, is from my mother's CD collection. You might have seen that video uh, a few weeks ago where my mother didn't want her CDs anymore. She gave them to me to do with as I pleased. And uh, this one I mentioned as being one that I actually bought myself. And I, if I remember correctly, I bought it off of Skip's Bargain Wall way back, you know, years and years ago. And for some reason, I didn't keep it myself and gave it to her. I don't know why I didn't keep it myself uh, after I re-listened to it, but it is just wonderful. It's delightful. It is three Mo tenors. As I said, I don't know why I didn't keep it for myself and gave it up because uh, I guess my musical tastes weren't as broad or, I, or part of it was probably because I didn't know what to expect and so I was kind of thrown off by it. But now that I re-listen to it, I, I love this album. It's, it's got opera stuff like, like the three tenors did in their day. Uh, and it's also got some uh, gospel and uh, uh, traditional, you know, hymns and stuff, gospel stuff, as well as some uh, R&B and soul classics from the 50s and 60s and 70s. So, I mean, it's got a huge w wide variety of stuff on here. And I believe the whole thing, I think, is done uh, in front of a live audience. So it is a live album. You can clearly tell that they have fun singing the songs that they sing. And the voices, their voices are just phenomenal. And it's uh, a wide uh, age, age range of the three, between the three guys, too. That's another thing that kind of struck me about this. It's, you know, one of the guys has is, is, uh, got gray hair and I think was in his 70s or maybe 60s when he did this. And uh, one of the other guys is like in his 20s or 30s. So, yeah, multi-generational and multi-genre in the album. So I don't think they did any more albums. I might be wrong about that, but uh, it's kind of sad if they didn't. So, yeah, this was just very, very entertaining from top to bottom. It was just a wonderful album. You gotta you gotta check it out if you can find it anywhere. Okay, last but not least, let's move on to the cassettes that I listened to over the past month. Uh, first one here is the only one in this list that is not from the big cassette haul that I got from my mother's friend Sue. This is the exception. I got this one from a friend of mine. This is Billy Joel, his greatest hits, volume one and volume two. Uh, I do have all of Billy Joel's studio albums on CD, but this, uh, this release does have one or two uh, songs that were exclusive to his greatest hits. One of the classic artists of the 80s, and for darn good reason. Uh, yes, so many, so many good songs on this. Uh, it's, you, I, I would name the entire track listing, uh, but then that would make the video excessively long. So, yes, check out Billy Joel if you haven't yet. I'm sure you have, uh, so I don't know why I'm saying that, but yeah. Wonderful stuff, and uh, thank you to my friend for uh, gifting me that cassette, as well as a couple of other Billy Joel tapes uh, along with it. And then these next four are from Sue's Cassette Hall, as I mentioned. Percy Sledge. Uh, this, I believe this is a compilation. I don't think this is a studio album. but uh, And I don't know that I have ever heard... I mean, I've probably heard on the radio or whatever a couple of Percy Sledge songs, but I've never had a Percy Sledge um, recording at all in my, uh, in my collection before. So this was a fun fun selection of, of hits. When a Man Loves a Woman, of course, the, the, his probably his most successful song. He also does a, a version of Otis Redding's Dock of the Bay, which is very, very nice. This is only like eight tracks or maybe ten, maybe ten. So yeah, not a huge uh, lengthy uh, collection of songs, but still very, very nice. I mean, he was one of the, right along with Otis Redding, as I said, and uh, Sam Cooke, the three big soul singers of the 60s. Uh, just fantastic stuff. He's a legend in his field for good reason. And then another, a legend of another sort, we have Neil Sedaka. I mean, hey, maybe a little cheesy, but hey, he had great talent, and he's he was just as talented for his songwriting as he was for his singing. He did probably, I think, probably a lot more songwriting than a lot of people think. He had some good hits on here. Um, uh, Breaking Up is Hard to Do, one of his biggest hits. Uh, Calendar Girl, which is one of the most cheesy songs on this compilation, but still... You know, there, there's a place uh, I kind of have. He's one of those artists that I kind of have a soft spot for. Uh, from the, the 60s and 70s, I think, is, is was his heyday. So, yeah, now I have some Neil Sedaka when I, I didn't before. So, And then um, this next one, Barbara Mandrell. And now an interesting story with this tape. Uh, there were, I believe, just three. That, I can't remember if there were more than that uh, tapes in Sue's collection, uh, Barbara Mandrell tapes. And But this is the first one that I was able to listen to all the way through. Uh, the first one I think I tried was actually Broken, and then the second one I played, which was actually right before this one, had a horrible squeaking noise 
in in the the movement of the tape so that was just so distracting and it actually kind of the, the sound was actually deteriorated as well so uh, i decided not to chance listening to more than a couple of songs of that and took it out of my machine before something bad happened so yes unfortunately this is the only barbara mandrell tape uh, at least so far i can't remember if there are any others as i said uh, in sue's collection that i listened to and this was a lot of fun uh, this have uh, the nearness of you which is a hoagie, hoagie carmichael song one of the great uh, great american songbook songs and i can't remember ever hearing a vocal version of that song before barbara mandrell's version i think all i've heard before was instrumentals as far as i can remember i might be uh, blanking on that but uh, yes some fun fun songs on here do you know where your man is well that's not a fun song that's a that's a sad song a ballad uh but yeah i'm not your super superwoman which was um i believe it was written by la reed and babyface uh, so yeah, this it was kind of an R&B song. Yeah, this album was from 1990. A great album. I'm uh, I'm considering looking into Barbara Mandrell's other albums as well. So yeah, fun stuff. Broadening broadening my country horizons. And speaking of broadening my country horizons, I was very very pleasantly surpri surprised by this one, Eddie Rabbit, his uh, number one hits album, a uh, greatest hits compilation. This is a lot. This was a lot of fun. As I said, so much more fun than I thought it was going to be. Uh, his big hit, "I Love a Rainy Night," which was a pop crossover hit, great stuff. And uh, "Someone Could Lose a Heart Tonight" that was another standout on this uh, set. So yeah, I'm very, very strongly considering checking out Eddie Rabbit in more detail. There are a couple of other Eddie Rabbit uh, studio albums in the cassette collection that I got from Sue. So I'm looking forward to listening to those. This was the first Eddie Rabbit uh, tape in the collection that I listened to. So yes. Lots of great, great discoveries coming out of Sue's uh, cassette collection. So thank you, Sue. And so that'll do it for my playlist for the month of April 2021. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, hit that like button and share it with your friends. And give me your thoughts, questions, suggestions, or constructive criticisms in the comment section below. Also, scroll down to the description for the link to my Twitter and Instagram feeds, and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.